you don't have to be the victim of your environment. You can also be the architect of it. James Clear. DZ Tribe, Josh Thomas, if you haven't already, check out thedozone.com for productivity tips, accountability, and overall just a great bunch of amazing human beings looking to get more stuff done. Once again, that's thedozone.com. Today's guest is Adam McChesney. Adam is the owner partner of Hike Digital St. Louis. Hike Digital is one of the fastest growing digital marketing agencies in the country and one of the only ones doing the franchise model. Hike Digital St. Louis won Franchise of the Year in 2021 and is the largest of all 16 locations. Adam, welcome to the Do Zone. Say what's up to the Do Zone tribe here and tell me something you believe is the key to getting stuff done that most people wouldn't think of. Yeah, how's it going, everybody? Josh, thanks for having me on. Super excited to be here. I think the key is auditing what you're currently doing. It's really simple and easy to go and try to learn more stuff about what other people are doing and trying to find the next quick fix or a Band-Aid to what you're currently doing. But for me personally, and a lot of people in my network, really auditing the current environment, the current things that you're doing to be able to see what's working and what's not is often the best and easiest way to actually get more productive and to figure out what you need to do. Kind of taking an inventory, so to speak. Absolutely. And so once you've taken your inventory of, uh, hey, here's what's working, here's what's not working, how do you, how do you kind of manage you know, squeezing out those things that are not working and making more time for the things that are? So I think it, it comes twofold is one, you know, the, the quick fix or, or really understanding what other productive people are doing. That's kind of the shiny object. So you kind of initially want to drive yourself towards figuring that out and implementing it into your routine or your daily habits. But until you know what's working and what's not, you really can't implement things that you have no idea if they're going to work or not just because they're working for someone else. So I take what I know is working and what's not working and figure out what my end goal is going to be or what I'm really trying to accomplish. And then that's when I step into that next phase of analyzing the most productive people or people who are living the life that I want to live in some sort of fashion and then implement their processes or their particular habits into my life to trial and error it to see if it's going to work for me and if it's going to work long term. So there's a filter that you apply. So we're, I want to model what somebody else is doing, but, but not blindly, because I need to make sure it's something that's going to work for me. Because if not, it's just a shiny object. And that's, that's an interesting perspective. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So I think, you know, as I've gotten into self-development, you know, before I was in corporate America. And so I started to listen to, you know, some very productive people, uh, mostly in the sales realm. And I started listening to what they were doing. And I just started to try to implement those things in my life, not even realizing what was working or not working in my life. And what ends up happening is you go to conferences or masterminds or you read a particular book and you get super excited and you're ready to go. But then you come back from that event or you come back from that high and you realize I can't do what they're doing because it's on a completely different level. So you have to kind of start back at ground zero and then you realize, well, I don't know what's working or not working in my current habits or, or life and things like that. So I think- the and, then you don't, way, and then you end up not doing anything. Exactly. And that's what I did. That's what I did for years. I mean, I was very successful in corporate America, but at the end of the day, I kept, you know, kind of hitting a, a you know, a plateau because I couldn't figure out what was going on in my life that was working or not. I just ran a thousand miles an hour and was successful. And any try, anytime I tried to get better, it was the, sh the shiny object that I would come back and then not do anything with it. But then I didn't know what was working or not, you know, in my own life. And so you've, you've kind of gone through this metamorphosis, so to speak. I know that you're originally were in medical device sales. And I, I know a lot of guys who have been or are in that industry. And it's one of those things where it's pretty lucrative it's not too tough, um, but it's also not all that interesting and, and kind of creates some complacency. Tell me, you know, tell me a little bit about what you were doing there and, and what caused you to want to transition out. 
Yeah. So I think the, the word that you said that really rings true is complacency. So it's very lucrative. As you mentioned, it's not all that difficult. I was uh, selling CPAP equipment. There was literally two different manufacturers. So you either had to buy my product pretty much, or you had to buy the, the competitor's product. Yeah. And so I got into medical device sales in some sort of fashion uh, about seven years ago. I did it for five years between two different companies. And when I, when I went into my second company, it was supposed to be like a starter role. So I was going to learn the ins and outs of the products, the business, all of those different things. Well, then the guy that was ahead of me left. And so there was this brand new role that the company didn't even really know about. And I'm sitting here nine months in and about at least eight to 10 years younger than most of the key account managers that were ahead of me. Well, I had a good track record. I was doing all the right things. I was running a thousand miles an hour, working insane hours, traveling all over the country, and I got promoted. So I went overnight from making about 70 to $80,000 a year to at minimum making about 150 and I ended up capping out about 200. So overnight at the age of 27, you see that big of a drastic difference and then you have all the benefits. You have all the perks of being in medical device sales at the top company in the industry. And so I did that for about a year and a half in that role, probably closer to two years. And then I just got so complacent, realizing that my end goal was always to be a key account manager when I first entered the company. That happened within nine months. And then I looked at all the people that were ahead of that. And I'm like, okay, is that really what I want to do? Do I want to take on more responsibility for a little bit more of money? And it just ate at me. I couldn't stay focused. I couldn't get you know, I was still having success, but it was, it was like, at what point, what is it, what is it really worth to me to continue doing this? And so that's when I made the transition and I had a, a kind of a three month process in my mind of when it actually happened, but it all happened in the midst of COVID. So that's when I finally left. It's one of the hardest things to do. Uh, and I'm, and I'm sure our, our tribe of listeners can, can relate. It's one of the hardest things to do to walk away from a nice, secure, steady paycheck, especially if it's big. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've said this a few times, uh, but pretty much in, in this world, in this reality, once you get to around $10,000 a month, give or take, uh, the world becomes basically free. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can have, you can afford a decent place to live almost anywhere. Uh, you can go and eat at any restaurant that you want within reason. Uh, you can drive whatever kind of car you want within reason. Uh, and you can take whatever kind of trip you want. And you really don't have to worry all that much about money. And so if the money is, you know, you said earlier about, well, I could add on this extra responsibility for a little bit more money. Like the money stops mattering after a certain point and you start looking at, well, what is the value of my time? Did you kind of run into that? Where is that? Is that what was kind of running through your head? Yeah. So I think I looked at like, you know, the next five, 10, 15 years ahead of me and, and had a lot of those things. But I realized more importantly, right after I got married, uh, what it would have been about a year, probably about nine months before I ended up leaving is that as I was going to go do all these things, eventually, you know, was getting married, starting a family, doing all the, the you know, the, the grown up things per se, is that. I didn't want to be working, you know, from the time I woke up to the time I go to bed and traveling on the road two out of four weeks uh, a month. And I just didn't like the lifestyle and the money, the money was great. I mean, at the, at the age that I was at for the things that I was doing, I couldn't have asked for a better opportunity, but as you mentioned, it's just not all about the money. And it was everything else that was coming with it. That was a burden to me is like, Hey, this is not what you want to do. Even though from the time I really found out about medical device sales early in college, I was like, that's what I'm going to do. That's always what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to do. And I did it and realized it wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> it's weird how that happens. Like, I am sure that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And then you get there and you're like, this sucks. I want to do something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, so it, it was time for a change. COVID happens. You're transitioning out. What was one of the first things that you kind of realized that you could do and that you were good at. I, uh, I know that you like to talk about this, 
concept called digital real estate. Is that, was that kind of the next step for you? Yeah. So back in 2018, right before I got promoted into the, the role that I ended up leaving, I was always had kind of the entrepreneurial bug, but I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was looking for ways to make money online, doing drop shipping, eBay, affiliate stuff. And I got targeted by an ad that taught the ability to build digital real estate in the same fashion that you would be a real estate investor, you know, with apartments or homes or, or complexes, things like that. And so basically the course taught how you build a bunch of websites, you rank them to the first or second page of Google, and then you start owning the real estate and renting it out to local companies. So I had done that kind of, you know, up until right when I left, but I had the skill set already with the ideas of what I was going to do with it. And then a couple of the websites were on the first page of Google producing a couple hundred calls a month. So I'm like, all right, I have this secret sauce from what I was taught and I know how to get there. Let's go do it for more people. And then that's really when I just got the bug of like, hey, I'm addicted to the success of what these clients are having and what this can do for more people. And, and you saw an opportunity that you could do that as a business instead of medical device sales. Yes, I did. And was there an, an, an ultimate kind of catalyst that, that helped you kind of launch out of that and into this next thing? Was there, was there a kind of a defining moment that said, okay, it's time? So really it was COVID. Um, you know, I, before COVID started, I basically started 2020. And my goal, I wrote it down, was by the end of this year, my idea was December 31st, I'm going to quit. Mm -hmm. And COVID sped it up. So our industry kind of went downhill as most did. Um, obviously it picked back up, but I realized like, hey, I went from traveling all of the time to not being at home. And now I'm stuck in my house and our customers are shut down. There's all these different things. We're taking a bunch of time off. And I just really started like diving into the business. And over the course of six weeks, you know, my little business that I had quadrupled. And so I'm like, all right, in order for this, this is becoming way too big of an opportunity. In order for me to focus my time and effort to be able to go and do this, I need to quit. I could have coasted, you know, in both industries for the next six months and been a lot more comfortable, but I was so checked out at the point that I'm like, Hey, it's now or never. Hmm. Yeah. And uh you know, and, and for, for our tribe that are kind of listening in here, I'm, I'm sure there's this moment where you, you just have to decide. I've, I've been in that position where I have a job, I'm making gobs of money and I just hate it. And there's something else that I could be doing, but there's this siren song of, you know, easy money, or there's some fulfilling work and, and it's, it's difficult sometimes to, to make that leap. But every time that you make that leap, you never regret it. Like we, we have these fears or, and I don't know about you, but kind of my, my wiring from my childhood is, um, you know, there's a, there's a little child inside of me that is just terrified that someday I'm going to run out of money and be homeless or something, mm -hmm. you know, even though it's never happened. And it's yeah. probably never going to happen. And there's all kinds of safety guards in place to make sure that it doesn't happen. But I'm still just kind of like that drives my decision making sometime. Somebody when I was, you know, 12 years old that was struggling to scrape by paycheck to paycheck said, don't ever leave a good job. And I listened, you know, and it's, it's tough. And, and so what, what gave you, aside from just being practical, what gave you the courage to just say, screw it, I'm going to do this instead. So I think a little bit, you know, I have a lot of the same stuff that you were talking about. It was always, hey, you're going to get a job. You're going to go do this. You're going to go do that. And I had a pretty decent uh, entrepreneurial background from different family members. My dad ran his own law firm for a while and things like that. But I think for me, it was like a little bit of like, hey, I want to prove people wrong. And help other people understand. Like for me, I want to show people through my, you know, personal social media and everything that I put out content wise, where I came from and where I'm at now, because 99% of people would have not left that job. And 
what I want to do is prove people wrong. People thought I was crazy. People probably still do think I'm crazy, but I really wanted to open up the idea that you don't have to follow this particular path day in and day out just because it's what someone told you to do. And so I wanted to go a little bit and shift away from the norm to one, prove people wrong, but also prove it to myself. I was getting to that age where it was like, all right, if you don't take a chance now and you fail, you're still going to be able to go back to medical device sales in some sort of fashion or some sort of industry like that. But if you try to do this 10 years from now, when you do have a family, when you do have all of these other things, and then you fail, if you fail, then what does that look like? So it was a combination of like, hey, I want to prove to myself, but I also want to prove people wrong because the minute that I told everybody that, friends, family, coworkers, it was like I had 17 heads and they thought I had gone crazy. (laughs) You know, it reminds me of uh, there is I I can't remember there was somebody who coined this phrase or or the concept, but it's kind of been adopted now is is about retire now. Yep. And don't wait until you're old to retire, retire now. And mm-hmm. the, the idea behind it is if you think about it, if you're in the prime of your life, uh, if you're somewhere in your twenties, thirties, forties, something like that, you are capable, able-bodied, uh, you are productive, you can go out and produce anything that you need. And that's the time that you need to go and visit Italy. That's the time that you need to spend a month in Thailand. That's the time that you want to take that uh, pilgrimage to your, you know, home country or to see your heritage or your culture or to go and see the pyramids, you know, because when you're 65 years old, it's going to be harder for you to move around. You're going to have less friends because they're starting to die, you know, and there's like, life is not, I'm not saying that it's not going to be enjoyable, but life is different on the other side, you know, on the back half. And so if you can enjoy life now, go enjoy life now, because if Mm -hmm. you fail now, you can just pick back up. But if you fail later in life, it's much harder to pick those, put those pieces back together because you have less time, you know, and that's, and that's what it was, what I was thinking when you were saying that is just go and do the things that you want to do right now. Don't wait. Mm, It's absolutely, it's only going to get harder as time passes. And that's, it sounds like that's the realization you came to. Absolutely. And the other thing is I invested heavily as, as you have in many of our network in in self-development and networks and things like that. So even if I did fail, let's just say tomorrow everything you know goes to crap, is I have the network, I have the skill set that I don't have that I could have never imagined having. I could go find a job within our network if I wanted to by the end of you know tomorrow if I really, really needed one. And so for me, you know, you look at whatever money, because obviously I took a, a step back from a variety of different reasons when it came to comfort security, finances, everything like that. You go from $200,000 to starting your own business. It's not necessarily a a direct correlation, but I cannot put a price tag on anything that I've learned over the last 18 months in any sort of fashion. And for me, that's the coolest piece to everything that's Mm -hmm. happened. That's right. Yeah. Well said, man. And so let's, let's kind of dive in a little bit. I want to crack your skull open and look at your brain. We're going to do a little <laughs> do zone diagnostic. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Excellent. So this is a series of five questions I ask every guest so that we can see how your brain ticks, soak up all the knowledge that we can. So just rapid fire. First thing that comes to mind. Number one, what's one thing you do that keeps you focused on your goals? So writing them down. I mean, I, for years, never wrote things down. I just set it in my brain. And now it's something that's written down. So that way I can keep track of it and stick to it. Well said, make it a permanent record. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Next question. How do you get back on track when you lose that focus? 
So I think for me, it's getting back to the basics. So it's fitness, health, and then just doing the work. Those three things, anytime I've fallen off track and I've wanted to get back on the right path, those things, things have driven me to be able to do so. Fitness, health, doing the work. Excellent. Next question, who is your support group and how do they keep you accountable? So I have, you know, I refer to it as two main support groups is one, obviously networks like Apex and, and masterminds that I'm in. The other is within our height franchise family. We have 16 other fran or seven or sorry, 15 other franchises that are out there and an entire support team on the corporate side. And so we're all holding each other accountable in one way or another, just as we do in Apex. Yeah, well said. And uh, where do you draw the line on what to do and what to delegate? So for me, it's been that's been an ongoing challenge is one, it's more so of auditing and taking an inventory of everything that's going on, kind of like we were talking about earlier. Now I've hired a COO and I have a business and a life coach as well. So a little bit of it is also seeking counsel because I'm not great in terms of delegating, it's more of a, a, not necessarily an ego thing, but I just like being the one to be able to get stuff done. So kind of leaning on my support system to be able to help me analyze what I need to be focusing on, delegating, automating, or completely getting rid of. Nice. And then final question, what is the number one pro tip you'd give to someone looking to get more stuff done in less time? So I would say it's definitely investing in yourself. So when you invest in yourself, whether it's monetarily, time, energy, whatever that ends up being for you in your particular situation, you're going to learn things about yourself. You're going to know what is actually working and driving you forward. And when you do that audit or inventory, you're going to understand what is setting you back or keeping you at status quo. So by investing yourself in some sort of, uh, of fashion, you're going to get those answers and really find the root of the cause of what's keeping you where you're at, whether that's being inefficient with your time or being effective with your time. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, and for those of you listening, every investment I've ever made in myself has always paid out a uh, an exponential return every single time. Any amount of money or effort or energy that I invest in myself has always paid me off. And it sounds, uh, it sounds like that's happened for you as well, Adam. It has. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things where like there are no guarantees in life and in investing and all that stuff, but an investment in yourself has an almost 100% chance of creating a return every single time. Well said, I couldn't agree more with that. And so tell me a little bit about, you made an investment in yourself and decided, you know what, I'm gonna take control back of my time and I'm gonna go in my own direction. And you, and you got involved with this company called Height Digital. Talk to me a little bit about that. How does it work? What do you do? Yeah, absolutely. So we are a full service digital marketing agency work with businesses of all shapes and sizes across the country. Um, when I first went out on my own back in July of 2020, I had my own marketing agency at the time. And we started growing really quick once I started doing the work, building my machine and getting referrals. So at the time, I was the one that was building the websites, doing the SEO, doing the paid ads, and it wasn't really scalable. And then I started growing out my team a little bit and hiring virtual assistants and things like that. And it got to a point where I was not able to take on any more clients. And so our clients were growing, you know, exponentially, but I had to basically say, okay, I can't grow anymore. And I'm not very good at processes and systems. I'm not the most organized guy from a um, kind of a process standpoint within an organization. And so in uh, June of 2021, an opportunity had came across to join Height Digital. So within digital marketing, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities to grow your business, virtual assistants, white label, full-time, part-time people. Height Digital wanted to put a spin on it. So we are the only one, I think there might be a couple more popping up, at least at this time, 
that actually is a franchise where we're all owner partners, where we open up our own location. So we have the backing of what would be a large 175 plus digital marketing agency with the small time feel and support. So right now I have two full-time account managers. I have a director of operations and then everyone else pools together our resources. So we each have our own web designers, SEO people, Google ads, et cetera. But it's, it comes without the price tag of paying for a company that has 175 people. We have all the processes and systems, the backend support, lead generation, um, personal branding, a bunch of stuff that goes along with it. So it's a unique twist on how to grow and scale your marketing agency effectively. Okay, interesting. And, and so who would be an ideal client for your services? Uh, who, can you kind of paint a picture of a handful of avatars that, that, that might need to engage with you? Yeah, so most of our clients are local-based home service businesses, so contractors of any sort people that don't necessarily have a storefront where customers come. So if you think about on the first page of Google, like if you think about realtors, uh, insurance agents, everyone kind of knows someone or has someone in their network that way. But if you have a plumbing issue or your roof's leaking or you want someone to power wash your house, a lot of times people don't know that. So they go to the first page of Google and they're calling the top companies there. So we focus on businesses that need to have that first page presence in some sort of fashion on a local standpoint, and we help them grow and scale their business. They have to be willing and able to obviously invest money, but more so have processes to grow and build their business as well. And give me an example of, uh, so somebody shows up on the first page of Google and uh, the they get a phone call from a potential customer. How... What does, what does height do to kind of really help facilitate the growth of this business? Can you just kind of dive into that a little bit more for, for anybody that maybe doesn't quite know how all this marketing stuff might work? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a lead tracking system. So a dashboard that our clients can log into at any given time. And it does a couple things, but it will tag the source of that particular phone call or contact form that comes in. So you're a, a contractor and you don't know where your leads are coming from and also what your return on investment is for Facebook, for Google ads, SEO, those types of things. We now give them that ability to see it all in one dashboard and then they can track their sales in that system, but it also integrates with most CRMs. So the one issue that a lot of contractors have as well is, okay, hey, we're a small operation. We are out doing jobs. We can't always answer the phone. And when we do answer the phone, it's very inefficient. We're writing you know, the, the lead information on, a, on the back of a business card in our truck, or everyone is overwhelmed at the office. That leads dashboard will all automatically take the lead and put it into their CRM, whether that's a phone call or a contact form. So we reduce their workload by about 50% when it comes to actually just nurturing the lead. But more importantly, we give them the visibility down to the penny on the dollar, what their return on investment is, assuming that they track it on their end. And that's really crucial because a lot of times uh, I hear this kind of uh, inexplicable response to, I can't afford to invest money in advertising. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. Uh, I think you're missing something important there, dude. But the problem is, it's not that they can't afford it, is a lot of times it's just opaque mm -hmm. what actually happens with that money. Like, okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of money. Now what happens? Well, I don't know. Hopefully, maybe I can get some customers out of it. But what you really <laughs> need and what technology is doing and what your process and system is doing, if I understand correctly, is... It's telling the it's telling your client who is the business owner, it's telling them, hey, if you put one dollar into this machine, this machine is going to tell you how many dollars you can pull out as a result. So the goal is I want to be able to put in one dollar and pull out two. If I can do that, now it starts to make sense for me to continue investing in the growth of my business and in advertising. Is that kind of a oversimplified explanation of what you're talking about? 
It is absolutely. And, and the problem with digital marketing and then obviously the business owners that invest in digital marketing is there's unrealistic expectations that have been set on both sides or either not set, for example. And then the other thing is that it is a partnership. So we can do everything on our end in terms of getting you more business or not getting you business. But until you actually take responsibility as the business owner to track everything on your end, whether we're doing really well or whether we suck, you're never going to have any sort of idea if you're not actually tracking it on your end to be able to then grow and scale your business. We see businesses come to us all the time. They're like, hey, I've worked with five other marketing agencies and they all suck. And I want you to fix all of my problems and we're going to have to do an audit. It's like, hey, it might not be, not that the marketing agencies absolutely killed it, but it might not be all on them. So taking a joint ownership and partnership on any marketing that you do, making sure you track, making sure that the KPIs are set as far as expectations go from the beginning will set you up for success or at least have you knowing, like when people work with us, I'm not going to say it's successful every time because it's not, but you at least know it. So there's no gray area to be like, hey, did it kind of work? Did it kind of not? It either worked or it didn't, or there's some sort of next action for us to be able to grow and scale the data that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate your honesty and sincerity on that because, you know, sometimes things just don't work. That doesn't mean that it can't work. It just means mm -hmm. that it's not. And exactly. if you have data, then data will tell us what to do next so that we can actually make it work. Exactly. Yeah. Well said, man. And so where can, uh, where can we go to learn more about uh, what you do and, and potentially engage with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to height digital.com. That's H I T E digital.com slash Saint or S T dash Lewis. And then that's our URL for height digital St. Louis. Okay. Excellent. So uh, heightdigital.com forward slash ST dash L O Lewis. All right. Yes. An easier URL. So I know. I'm working on it. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'm working. I'll allow it. I will allow <laughs> it. So cool. And this has been Adam McChesney. Thank you so much for jumping on here. We're going to wrap up. Uh, for those of you who are looking for a way to engage your customers with digital marketing, you can visit heightdigital.com forward slash St. Louis. That's H I T E digital.com forward slash S T dash L O U I S. Thank you again so much, Adam, for being here. If you're a busy entrepreneur looking to get to the next level, head over to the dozone.com for more productivity tips, tools, and strategies. You can also join our Facebook group of the same name. Until next time, remember we all have the same 24 hours in a day. What are you going to do with yours?